Excellent. Uh, so I think we uh, I think we've started. Um, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ben Pollard, uh, CEO and founder of Cushion, and I'm joined here today by a brilliant expert panel uh, chaired by Joe Cumbo, global pensions correspondent at the Financial Times. Welcome, Joe. Hello. I'll let the other panelists introduce themselves shortly, but welcome to you all and thanks for joining us. I'm not on the panel today, so you'll see me disappear in a sec. I'll be in the audience with you listening in and what I'm sure is gonna be a fantastic session from this great group of people. We love audience interaction, so please do go ahead and post comments and questions in the chat box. There is some time aside, set aside at the end for the panel to debate your questions. The panel will be discussing investing for impact and how we can make pensions both a force for good and deliver better retirement outcomes and how these two things are connected. As anyone who follows Cushion will know, this is a subject very close to our own hearts. We launched the world's first net zero pension in January this year and more recently announced our new investment strategy, which will launch early next year. Our new strategy sees the largest allocation to private markets in the Master Trust sector and positive impact across 100% of the portfolio. That's something we're really proud of. But the other really important point of this new strategy is how it helps to get people more connected with the investments they hold via their pension. Better connections means better engagement and better engagement means better retirement outcomes. And this is where today's discussion is so important. The reality is a certain number of people might be able to name their pension provider, but only a tiny proportion will be able to name any of the underlying investments. This passive relationship is one of the reasons there's apathy, particularly among younger savers. And this is where the impact, where impact investing can make a real difference. It provides the opportunity to connect savers with investments in projects and companies that they can feel proud of and engage with. And the more engaged people are, the more likely they are to make good decisions, which ultimately lead to good retirement outcomes. So on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for joining and I'm going to hand over to Joe to get the discussion started. Thank Thanks very much, Ben, and welcome everyone. I believe there is about 200 people registered uh, for this event and watching today, not only in the UK, but in other parts of the world. So that's really excellent. And thank you for joining us wherever you are. And it's really good to be here with you for this webinar, which is going to delve into one of the hottest topics of this year. It's no understatement to say that climate and ESG in general has become a dominant theme of 2021. The increase in regulatory and policy focus on ESG investing has been dramatic over the past 18 months, with pension scheme trustees and managers facing a slew of new rules aimed at sharpening their focus on climate reporting. So how is Cushion and the wider industry responding to these new challenges? How can ESG be used to drive up member engagement? And how can the shift to investing for good be balanced with ensuring good member outcomes for members? These are the key questions that our excellent panel of speakers will explore during today's session. And our speakers are Julius Persal, Emily Pollock, Jennifer Nerlish, and Paul Skinner. And I'll ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment. But before we kick off, a reminder that you can submit questions to each of our speakers or the panel at any time during the discussion, but we won't get started or tackle them at the end. So to get us started, I'd like to ask Julius to introduce himself. Thanks, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Uh, delighted to have you all here. So for those of you who don't know me, I have a longer career in the defined contribution industry stretching back over many years now. Uh, more recently, I've been a non-executive, but I've been tempted back into an executive role by Cushion. Uh, and I thought I might just spend a couple of sentences explaining why I'm so excited to be here, uh, because it is a bit of a change after 20 years of just non-exec work, uh, not to run down non-executives for any of you in the audience who are also non-execs. Um, so why Cushion? Uh, Cushion asked me if I'd be interested in uh, developing, helping them develop the next iteration of the investment proposition that underpins their net zero now uh, at the proposition level. That's very exciting. Uh, I think what's particularly interesting about Cushion is this intersection that Ben's referred to between our capacity using our technology to reach out to members 
and create value, additional value from investment strategies that has simply not been possible in the past by making members feel more connected to their pension. That's great. Thanks very much, Julius. Emily, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Joe. So I'm Emily Pollock, and I'm a solutions director at Schroeder's Capital. Schroeder's Capital is the private market division of Schroeder's, and it's a $70 billion business spanning private equity, securitized credit, private debt, real estate, infrastructure, insurance and securities, and impact investment. And we're built around the pillars of innovation, sustainability, and solutions. And working with Cushion really characterizes all three of these things. Within the Private Asset Solutions Group, I spend my time working with our largest clients, either building specialized portfolios or building new products for, for a type of clients. And, and with that, we were really committed to democratizing private assets, bringing it to a broader group of people. Um, and I've spent my whole career in, in private markets, and it's just really nice to see the shift and the emphasis now placed on ESG and sustainability. So I really believe strongly that you do not need to sacrifice returns to have your capital be a force for good and, and working with Cushion and being able to implement uh, their private market portfolio really speaks to, to the values both of Schroeder's capital and what, what I like to do. That's great, thank you, Emily. Jennifer. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jennifer Nerlich. I'm part of Selective Strategic Initiatives team. Um, there I'm focused on working on ESG projects internally as well as externally and also collaborating with our client when it comes to index solutions. Selective is an international index provider which is based in, mainly based in Germany. We provide um, various multi-asset um, index solutions in the equity as well as in the fixed income space. And back in 2007 when Selective was founded, our CEO, Stefan Schäuble, had the vision to really focus on the clients, implement client-focused solutions, and um, disrupt the indexing industry, which was dominated by only a few players. So together with um, Cushion, we created a cost-effective and ESG-focused index solution, which helped the um, pension industry to get into ESG with a cost-efficient way and focus on climate as well as ESG criteria as an outcome. So I'm happy to be here today and talk more about the integration of this criteria in the strategy. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And last but not least, Paul. Hello, morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in front of you. Uh, thank you all for spending the time uh, listening to us. Um, but my name is Paul Skinner, as you heard. I'm an investment director at Wellington Management on the fixed income side. Um, and Wellington is probably uh, one of the largest investment management firms you won't have heard of, but we run about $1.3 trillion in equity and fixed income. And uh, for Cushion, uh, we manage the Global Impact uh, Bond Fund. Now, the Impact Bond Fund has a dual mandate. It has uh, a responsibility to outperform financial markets. So we want to outperform fixed income globally, but we have another objective, which is to invest that capital purely for impact, i.e. to pro produce a positive contribution on social and environmental challenges around the world. And we'll look forward to chatting a little bit more about uh, what we do. That's great. Thank you very much, Paul. And thanks to all of our speakers for that introduction. Now, uh, to kick off uh, the discussion today, I'd like to start with a question on the most important area, and that is members. So, Julius, um, how aware are members of the impact their pension is having on the environment? Well, they're not very aware, but they are very interested in the topic once uh, they're made aware that it interacts with the environment and the climate in particular. So a year ago, we ran some uh, surveys which suggested only half a percent of the workforce uh, as a whole has any clear idea whatsoever of the uh, carbon footprint of their pension, and even in very, very broad terms. So actual awareness is extremely small, but we know at the same time that interest, if prompted, can be very high indeed. Thank you, Paul. Um, the pension and investment industry, or basically the broader investment industry, has faced a raft of initiatives from governments and regulators. 
How have they responded to this push to take account of climate in their portfolios? Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. And when we look into the current initiatives, we see growing commitment, which is great to see. So looking, for example, back to the Glasgow COP26, we saw that now more than 130 trillion US dollars of capital are committed to reach net zero in 2050. And over 450 firms um, con um, contributed to this commitment. So we see that there is commitment. And what's great is that we are also all required to set now science-based targets, which require interim targets to move forward, provide products to our um, clients, and really foster the transition towards reaching net zero and taking care of our climate. Thank you, Jennifer. And Emily, do you have any observations um, for us on how the industry is responding? Yeah, so, I mean, I think we've now seen the industry talking about it and really led by the Northern European and UK pensions over the last, say, 10 years, but over the last two, three years as regulations have changed. As Jennifer said, setting science-based targets and having the, um, being able to, to really focus on that is what has um, made it the, the biggest um, sort of contribution at this point. Thank you. And Paul, how much uh, appetite is there among um, retail and institutional investors for ESG? I mean, it's an amazingly powerful force at the moment. Um, the, uh, the regulatory side for some of the biggest uh, DB pension funds, uh, the Task Force for Climate uh, Financial Disclosure, TCFD, has been a real motivator to get um, some of these biggest uh, defined pension uh, pension funds, um, incorporating some really advanced views on how they are going to move forward um, towards net zero. But at the same time, you've got the asset management uh, industry also um, really pushing behind that. And um, we are founder members of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Um, and that is enabling our clients to see how we can move towards net zero, how we can incorporate that in investments. And um, that has already shown very powerful uh, results. So, um, you know, we have that on the regulatory side, on the big institutional pensions, but also there's an undercurrent of understanding from stakeholders right the way down to retail about the importance of what's going on in climate change. And I think that understanding is driving a huge flow of capital into uh, environmental ESG um, investing. And just to you know, give you an idea of how big that growth is, last year in um, fixed income, we had about 500 billion uh, green bonds issued. This year, it looks as though we're gonna hit a trillion dollars. So you know, it's doubled in size in the space of one year. And that's because regulators, and the underswell of people's interest um, uh, are meeting together in a flow of capital. Thanks very much, Paul. That's really interesting. Now, I just want to drill down into um, what Cushion is doing now, particularly with this bespoke strategy to address climate change. Now, Julius, you can tell us a little bit more about um, Cushion launched just over a year ago with a set strategy but it's changed so tell us a bit about what you're trying to do and why you have this new investment strategy why it's changed absolutely so um we we begin by thinking about how we can progress our portfolio towards our net zero objectives and we do that in a number of different and um and sometimes very complex ways so i'm going to break it down into the three asset classes that we think about and, and how we've constructed those portfolios and why we've done something different. Um, I'm going to leave it to my colleagues on the panel to talk in more detail about the individual investment sleeves. They're a better place than I am. But to give you a, a high overview, uh, the, the largest allocation in our, our investment uh, fund is clearly to listed equities. And we looked very hard at the marketplace to see if we could find what we wanted off the shelf. Now, what we wanted was something which combined uh, significant short-term reductions in carbon emissions uh, with some forward-looking metrics, which uh, allow us to anticipate risk uh, on a forward-looking basis. So we protect our members from the bad risks that have come about as a result of climate change and expose them to the good ones. We couldn't find exactly what we wanted, and we certainly couldn't find an index which also added in 
uh, some elements of this, the sustainable development goals. That was very important to our trustees because we couldn't find one. We created one from scratch uh, with help from Selective. So that's the listed equities. The bonds are very important because we also think it's important to actively seek out companies which are uh, supporting transition and themselves need support for that successful transition. And our active bond mandate, therefore, allows us to lend, monies, lend money to companies that have very good transition plans. And then finally, the private market sleeve. Why is that important? It's important because uh, it provides uh, an additional growth engine. It provides some great diversification. It provides some great engagement opportunities. We're going to talk all about those uh, in more detail later on. Uh, but crucially, it allows us to invest in climate solutions. So this is, uh, in many ways, the most exciting part of the portfolio. This is where we invest in wind, in solar, uh, where we invest in battery technology, where we invest in forestry, and in due course, we'll be investing in uh, things like green hydrogen. Um, thanks, Julius. You've decided um, the current allocation is going to be 75% to global equity, corporate bonds, 10, private markets, about 15. What was the strategy behind that split? Well, that, that's a great question. Um, and I would say that uh, there's no single right answer here, is there? Um, many trustees and many potential advisors and clients will, will arguably want a marginally different solution. We, we can cater for that because we can combine these building blocks in different ways if you have strong views. Our trustees' views was that uh, were that, um, generally speaking, we think that members need to take uh, more risk uh, in DC schemes than they have typically taken. Hence, we have an allocation to growth assets, which given we have about half the private markets in due course allocated to private equity is getting pretty high, but it's still not 100% because we have some other assets inside our private market sleeve, some property uh, and some private debt, and we have a 10% allocation to bonds. So this is a compromise. We think it's a great compromise because it's uh, a compromise that lands at the higher risk end of the spectrum. Um, and, you know, we could debate, should the bond allocation be 15, should it be 10, should it be 20, should it be five? different views in the marketplace, but I'm very comfortable we've landed on, uh, on a, a, an attractive position for our members. Thanks, Julius. And uh, the questions are starting to flow in. There's a lot of interest in, in the strategy. We're going to drill down now into each component of this new investment strategy to, to find out how it's going to deliver on the, on the broader climate goals for Cushion. Jennifer, I'll start with you because uh, Global Equity is going to be doing the heavy lifting with 75% of the portfolio. So just tell us how the portfolio looks from an ESG perspective, please. Yeah, so um, maybe also give you some insights on the process. So from us, from our perspective, it was quite important to first understand what Cushion is looking for. Um, as Julius described, there was no off-the-shelf index um, which directly fitted their needs. So there were various iterations to come up with the um, solution which combines on the one hand strict decarbonization targets right at the beginning, as well as over time and looking into additional screening, which look for example, especially into transition risks of companies. So climate transition risks, if a company is well prepared to also uh, transition to a low carbon economy, it looks into SDG assessments, as well as other controversial areas which are excluded, such as breaches with international norms in the human rights area, labor standards, but also in the area of controversial weapons, which should not be included in the index. From my perspective, it's quite important to note that on the one hand, we first achieve a direct reduction in emissions. So here we set a strict target of 50%, which directly are reduced against the standard index um, to have a significant change in the emission profile. On the other hand, we require, and this is quite new to the indexing world, we require a self-decarbonization of year over year 7% to become in line with the Paris Agreement. So even if the underlying index is not decarbonizing, we will force the customized solution for Cushion to decarbonize over time to achieve the net zero goal in 2050 or latest in 2050. And as mentioned, we also look into other areas such as um, climate transition risks, which we directly optimize during the, um, during the index construction process. So therefore we achieve more attractive measurements, for example, in the share of green revenues, 
when we look into SDG assessments, we see improvements, which are also forced by the optimizer and also see better, for example, um, shares in renewable energy compared to the standard index. Thank you. And 7% year over year decarbonisation. How did you come up with that figure and how are you going to achieve it? Yeah. So the 7% year over year decarbonisation is um, inspired on the one hand by the EU climate transition benchmarks or EU Paris line benchmarks, which are built on the IPCC special report for 1.5 degree global warming, which was published in 2018. So there it was stated that we need this significant reduction year over year to come up with a Paris aligned benchmark. So we will implement this each year during the um, regular rebalances and force the decarbonization. Thank you. Now moving on to uh, bonds, which is about 10% of this new portfolio. Paul, can you explain some of the, the thinking behind um, what you're doing and what the, are the impact areas you are committing capital to? So um, as Julius explained, you know, you, you have your bond allocation because you need that as a balancing um, you know, asset, uh, less correlated with risk assets uh, than equity. So it's providing a sort of anchor. We want to make sure that we're first and foremost investing that in a safe way so that capital is safe. Um, and we know that it's going to perform in terms of, uh, you know, the financial results. But as you say, you know, we are investing that capital to make an impact. And um, there are three areas that we invest for that impact. Two of them are social, which is basic essentials, things like water provision, uh, nourishment, shelter. Then we have a second uh, social one, which is human empowerment. That's about education, bridging the digital divide um, and financial inclusion. And then the third part is of course the environment. And the environmental side, is uh, obviously to reduce carbon dioxide and, and uh, production. Uh, we have a major side of that, but we're also keen to have uh, the cyclical economy, recycling, um, preserving what we've got embedded in the portfolio. So um, we have 11 themes that we invest in order to create an impact. And importantly, we measure every single one of those investments as to how well they're doing in that impact area. And we set up key performance indicators, um, KPIs, which we can then report to uh, your investors and, uh, and they can see exactly how we're doing financially, but they can also see how much benefit they are having in the global economy. And how do you allow members to assess the impact your investments have? Well, we publish an annual uh, report on those KPIs, those key performance indicators. So we can tell you exactly, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of low income housing we have actually built with your capital. We can show you how many uh, children we've educated with new schools that we've built. And we can show you exactly the tonnage of CO2 that we've managed to avoid being emitted over the, over the year. So we can report precise numbers uh, to the stakeholders and this gets them interested this gets them stimulated they get um, uh, you know excited by that sort of engagement that goes far beyond the excitement for, of a financial uh, report but actually engages them on uh, a more interesting level um, and that is am I using my capital to do good or not thank you Paul Emily um, you're in charge of the private markets um, portion of this um, strategy. Tell us um, about how you went about bringing that together and what the strategy was behind the assets you chose. Yeah, so we will span the, the landscape of, of private markets and 70% of the portfolio will be focused on climate related initiatives with then 30% uh, on social. And within the climate bucket, you really need to think of, of three core themes and that's climate change mitigation, which is the efforts to reduce um, or prevent emissions, climate adaptation, which is then the process of everyone adapting to climate change and building resilience to climate related um, changes, both for individuals and communities, and then carbon sequestration or carbon capture through trees, nature, and then and new technologies. But only in combining all three of these different elements can you really focus and, and really attack 
um, climate change. And so we'll be investing through, as Julius mentioned, private equity, sustainable infrastructure, real estate, and natural capital. And each one of those then has slightly different themes. Um, and so within climate mitigation, solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, energy storage, energy, sustainable transport are some of the themes. Climate adaptation, you can think of natural catastrophe insurance, climate insurance, and then carbon capture is more on forestry, timber, and some of those other technologies that are being created. Thank you. And how does uh, this private market strategy overcome the issues for workplace pensions, particularly automatic enrollment of the price cap and liquidity? So it's important that we have a mix uh, of different types of assets. So we'll be investing in, in some that are a little bit more liquid, some that are, are truly illiquid, and there's also equity and, and debt investment. So uh, as I mentioned uh, at Schroeder's Capital, we are really um, committed to democratizing private assets, letting um, more investors have access to it. Uh, if you think about the returns of private markets, they've been able to charge a, a higher uh, fee historically just because they are also producing a higher return and we're closer to the assets. So having global investment teams that are then closer to the assets means that there, there will be a slightly um, higher fee. At the same time, um, we're working with many DC pensions to make sure that it becomes more accessible. Thank you, Emily. Now, flowing on from that, um, a question for Julius. Um, you've heard that Julius, the, the new strategy is going to be investing in assets that are, are more expensive. So how are you going to ensure that those, um, those returns are good outcomes for members? Well, we, we're choosing to invest in private markets because we think they represent good value in terms of member outcomes. That's, that's an investment belief. Uh, many people share it increasingly, I think, uh, participants in the market share that view, but some people won't share it, in which case that's fine. They can choose our proposition without private markets if they insist. We think that would be a mistake. So how do we ensure this re represents good value for money? Well, first of all, the, the price for this investment strategy, assuming you take the off-the-shelf default fund at 75, 10, 15 listed equity bonds, private markets, then we charge you 15 basis points. We charge your members 15 basis points, one five of investment TER. So that's not including administration governance, that's the investment TER. We think that is a fantastic price. There are no performance fees involved. We get nowhere near the charge cap. So the charge cap is simply not relevant. Um, and we've managed to get uh, as high as 15% allocation. We, we'd like to have gone further, but this marketplace is very price competitive. So not only do we need to uh, satisfy ourselves that these assets represent attractive risk adjusted returns for members at the price we're paying, which we absolutely believe. We also have to compete against organizations uh, that uh, are offering a very, very, very fine price into this marketplace. And we need to provide, we need to persuade those consultants and those potential clients that these private markets will deliver this extra value. So uh, that's the challenge we face. We're, we're very confident we can do it. This is a bespoke strategy, Julius, and people will, will want to know how you're going to hold yourself to account on your targets. Yeah, well, I think we hold ourselves uh, to account in uh, 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 two different dimensions, broadly speaking, one of which is in terms of risk adjusted returns. So, you know, we will be comparing our risk adjusted returns with those delivered by other master trusts. We expect the private markets uh, to have delivered excess value relative to those strategies that don't include private markets. We will test ourselves. We'll check to see whether that's the case as we build a performance record. The second way we hold ourselves to account is by being accountable for the impact that the strategy is delivering. And you've already heard uh, Paul talk in detail about some of the reporting. We have very uh, high levels of reporting across all three investment sleeves where we will um, regularly interact with our members and make sure they understand exactly the impact these strategies are having on the environment, both climate and more broadly. Thank you. The questions are really starting to flow in, so keep them coming. We're going to pause in potentially 10 minutes or so. So I've just got a few more questions for the, for the team, just looking more broadly at the, the pensions landscape and the vast majority of assets within the DC industry have been passively managed. We know that in default funds they are. Why does the panel think an active impact strategy is appropriate for inclusion? within default allocations. Paul, did you want to have a go at that? Yeah, I mean, the, um, uh, the, the problem with running impact passively is there's no specific definition of what impact it is. So um, it has to be 
a judgmental decision where you go in, you look at that uh, potential investment and you uh, understand where that capital is going. So we have very strict rules about what we count as an impact investment. And there are three basic um, you know, uh, criteria that we have to go through. First, it has to be material. So that materiality means that um, if it's use of proceeds, 90% of those proceeds must be committed to that theme that we're looking uh, for creation. The second thing is additionality. This must be new capability in that theme. It must be new housing. It can't be a wind farm that was built 10 years ago and just refinancing. We want things to be new and additive um, to uh, that particular theme. And then the final uh, aspect is we've got to be able to measure it, as I mentioned with those KPIs. Um, so, you know, we set a, a very high uh, bar for um, the investments that get into uh, the fund. And it's difficult to do that in a passive way. You, you, you're really going to, so being able to do it actively. Now, the second part is we do this in public funds in public uh, markets. So by using public markets, we can make sure that we keep costs down for cushion. And, um, and so not only is it liquid, i.e. you've got access to that capital uh, on a daily basis, but you have that ability um, to, to keep the costs down, even though it's uh, an actively managed uh, strategy. Thank you. And Emily and Jennifer, uh, did you want to come in? Yeah, so I, I think that private markets are, are really important within the DC space. And, you know, private markets have higher returns than the public markets, have lower correlation, and then provide additional diversification. And this really allows the DC market to access parts of the market otherwise just wouldn't be able to access. And also in private markets, we, we own these assets. So we're able to go in and really make the changes and really be impactful um, over the both near and longer term. Within our real estate business, we like to say that we have a hospitality mindset. When you think of hospitality, you think of restaurants and, and hotels, but it's really someone taking care, of, so taking care of you. And that's how we like to think of taking care of an asset. And so taking care of these properties, I think real estate lends itself as a really nice example in that you're making it either more efficient, you can insulate it better, you can bring up deprived areas, but you can really go in and add impact over the longer term. And especially for the DC pension market in the UK, adding both to your local investment, but then on a global basis, you're really providing that impact and creating a high return. Thank you. And Jennifer, did you want to have any observations yeah. there? Yeah, I think what's also important here to mention, so with the with equity allocation, we are in the end in the so-called passive area. I don't like the term because when you deviate from market cap, I think it's a good question if you're still passive. Um, so Cushion and we actively designed the index to integrate the ESG targets to get a portfolio which has less carbon emissions, which is targeting better transition risk scores, which has a better SDG assessment um, overall and also achieving this over a longer term while keeping in mind that we have to be cost efficient. Um, additionally, it's still not done, so we created a portfolio, but there can also be done engagement, proxy voting, and so on. So um, just saying passive investing is not impact investing. I think it's a good mix within the cushion solution between having active managers on board and also being cost aware, having a beta allocation to equities um, via a customized solution. Thank you, Jennifer. And Julius, in, in terms of um, getting employers um, interested and in considering these kind of strategies for their for their workplace members, and you know, it's the biggest place where people people are saving. How will you or how can you get employers on board when they're still largely choosing pension schemes on the basis of cost? Well, I think by uh, explaining to them that value is more important than cost. So how can we create value for employers? and their employees. Well, imagine two uh, engagement approaches, one of which um, involves trying to persuade members to understand uh, the very small pensions they're likely to enjoy at their current contribution rates at retirement, and try and use that as a hammer to hammer them into increasing their contributions. We've tried that in the industry for 20 years. It's proved to be uh, substantially a waste of money. Contrast with the strategy which allows, as an example, members to receive a live stream to their app 
of golden eagle chicks just hatching in forestry that they've helped to plant, the golden eagles that they've helped reintroduce, and the golden eagle chicks that their contributions are directly responsible for. So they'll get that stream to their app, down the pub on a Friday night. This is what my pension fund's done for me this, this week. What's yours done? We can make members proud of their pension. That goes well beyond making people uh, aware that their employer is uh, putting a contribution in on their behalf, although that's not a bad interim step to get to, which largely the industry has failed to do. We think that by uh, developing our impact strategies across all these investments, particularly in private markets, we can create obvious value for employees by making them feel proud about their pensions, which in turn creates value for employers. We think that's a really good reason to buy a pension scheme. Thank you, Julius. Now I'm going to go to questions and um, a reminder that you can just input those questions or make comments in that chat box and we're going to try and get through as many as we can in the next 20 minutes or so. So the first question, and I think this one is for Paul specifically, with green bonds, what are the yield spreads on average when compared to benchmarks? Do green bonds outperform comparators? Well, the green bond market is, as I mentioned, uh, an enormously uh, uh, fast growing market. And um, therein lies some opportunity, but also some risks in that um, there is no official nomenclature about what you uh, can call a green bond or a sustainable bond or a social bond. So you actually have to do quite a lot of work to make sure that the credentials of that bond are, um, are, are what you want to achieve. So I would say, first and foremost, it's a large and growing market, but I would caution that you can buy everything that's green in there because um, there are some uh, issues that uh, patently don't have the criteria uh, that we'd want uh, to have that. In terms of the yield you can get, um, you know, the um, green bond market or the, the market where we find impact investments is generally investment grade. So that's giving you a spread of one about one percent over and above um the uh the sort of sovereign rate but there is an increasing market in the higher yielding uh parts of fixed income uh, and there we can pick up spreads of 200 sorry two and a half or three percent uh, above the, the sovereign uh, index and by combining some of those high yield issues that we really like and think are, are capital secure with a higher quality portfolio you can build something uh, with real diversity and, and provide um, a, a very good return over time. And if you look back at the, the fund of the last couple of years, I think it returned 8% uh, last year, 5% the year before. So, th th you know, that's the sort of concept that uh, we're building um, by using these bonds. And remember, this is a global portfolio. So it's accessing both emerging issues, developed market issues, um, municipals, it's, it's, a, it's a very diversified and varied. Thanks, Paul. I'm just going to pick up on that initial comment you made about the lack of nomenclature or, or definitions. Mm. Greenwashing, and that's a word we hear often, but do you think that greenwashing and the lack of definitions affects confidence, investor confidence in investing? I think it does. I think it does. I mean, some of the issues that we've seen presented uh, to us have been, you know, dubious in the extreme. I mean, tobacco companies that are um, producing a sustainability linked bond based upon the number of people they can start vaping. Now, that, that is an extraordinary uh, concept that somebody can even think uh, of producing that uh, as a bond. So I think there are complications there. And the EU are moving rapidly to become the, the global um, uh, sort of initiator for some proper regulation. And we expect that during the first half of next year. So I think then we'll get much more credibility and, and people will feel more comfortable with it. But until that time, we still have to go into every name, look at what's in there, look at where the capital's being used. I mean, we, we even had a, a long conversation with the Italian debt management organization. They issued a green bond. Um, and, you know, the conversation we had was, well, we want to have some sort of, um, you know, uh, assurance where that capital is going. And so they ended up appointing um, an independent auditor to do that. And that's the sort of credibility we want to get into, into these sort of bonds. Thanks, Paul. Question now, I think, for either Emily or Julius. Or did, was, did someone else want to add to that? Silence, I take that as a no. 
a question for Emily or Julius, um, potentially, probably more Emily. Um, liquidity is a concern when it comes to private markets. Does this affect members who are reaching retirement? So I'll start and then maybe Julius can, can add, add on. Um, so within the private market portfolio, we have constructed it so that there is some degree of liquidity. And this is by combining an, a number of different sub-asset classes within this. So there are varying liquidity degrees, but there, there will be some liquidity. And you should also think of a private markets portfolio, which is either returning income or you know, constantly generating returns, which then also will provide some liquidity. Given it's only 15% of the portfolio also, the majority of your portfolio also still is very liquid. So you should think of this as a longer term return driver within the portfolio and a real diversifier. So it plays a real role in that it's both providing real impact because we are so close to the, um, the assets, but then there also is some liquidity there that we've been structured in and then it, but it's the longer term return driver is how you really should think of it. Thank you. And Julius, did you want to follow up? Yeah, I, I think that for any any master trust, uh, this is simply not an issue for uh, a number of decades. Uh, any master trust has a wall of money coming in from contributing members. And the proportion of money that is leaving through either retirements or deaths or transfers out is very, very small. Now, before allocating this 15% uh, proportion of our funds, we did extensive modelling at each individual cohort of members by decade, the monies that were coming in, the monies that were going out, this is simply not an issue we need to worry about. So I, I frankly think that worries about valuation and liquidity in private markets are just overdone. These are not reasons for taking the plunge and investing in private markets. Thank you. Um, we've got a few questions here. One, of it, one question for Jennifer. Um, it looks quite techy. I'll put it to you. Um, the question is, is sharp ratio not useful to measure the performance of mixed allocation funds? Is that one you can, can deal with? Um, I can generally comment on this, um, but for the specific allocation, maybe it's more worth than also looking to Julius. Um, so from a sharp ratio perspective, overall, um, first looking into the index, what we have seen is that it uh, achieves very attractive returns. So I mentioned before, it's a core beta allocation. What we made sure is that it stays close to the char risk characteristics of the general market cap weighted benchmarks. And we expect um, by having allocated more to the leaders in the climate space that this could also lead to potential outperformance over time. Um, having said this, um, the combination, definitely it's good to have also the um, passive allocation, uh, or not the passive, the fixed income allocation aside to make it more stable over time and limit drawdowns. Um, but handing over to Julius, um, as he might be more aware of the sharp ratio for the three asset portfolio. Well, sharp ratios, yeah, some people like them, some people pre prefer Sortino ratios. Personally, I like to disaggregate ex post vol and ex post return. That's how I like to think about realised risk. So that's how we think about and measure risk at, uh, at Cushion, by just looking at ex post vol uh, and ex post um, return. Uh, but since I've got the floor, there's a, a very interesting question in there, which kind of touches on some of the points that, um, that Jennifer raised, if you don't mind, Joe. Um, talking about whether backward-looking metrics or forward-looking metrics are right in the context of value for money. Um, personally, I think that uh, an excess reliance on backward-looking metrics is not the, the only way to go about value for money measurement. It's certainly important. But I think good fiduciaries also think about forward-looking metrics. Not least, uh, to quote a speaker at a conference I was chairing last week, never has past performance been a less reliable guide to future returns. And that is all because climate is going to see some really major dislocations in this marketplace. So um, we should not only be looking backwards, we should definitely be looking forwards. Thank you. Did anyone else in the panel have a question or want to follow up with any comments on that? No, I mean, just to agree with uh, Julius, you have to look forward. And, um, you know, it, as we have this voyage, um, you know, towards net zero, the most important thing is going to be engagement with companies. You know, we have to engage with them, find out what their plans are, find out how they are going to uh, implement um, the, these various changes. And, and that has to be a forward looking thing. You have to go and interact, find out what a company is doing, um, engage with them 
um, you know, help them on that uh, journey. And that's very much what we believe um, is, is going to be the path forward as we all embark on this, uh, you know, journey uh, to, to, to make uh, net zero uh, a, a real thing. Thank you, Paul. A question now. Um, this is probably Julius, but Ben, if he's out there, if he wants to jump in, can respond to this too. The question is, are the cushion trustees at risk of limiting their ability to change or challenge Schroeder's on performance? How are they managing this? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand why they would be um, in, a, in a difficult position to challenge Schroeder's. Uh, we treat the Schroeder's mandate and the trustees will treat the Schroeder's mandate just as any other mandate. Um, we have um, some agreed parameters and Schroeder's will report against them. So I'm, I'm not quite sure why, why we would be constrained in, in holding Schroeder's to account. Thank you. There isn't any follow up, but if the person who submitted that question has any further comments, they can submit them by the, the chat box. But thanks for responding to that, Julius. There is a question now. Um, the panel, anyone in the panel can have a go at this one. Sustainable investing is currently flowing into environmental thematics. Can you explain how much is directed at the other themes on SDGs, e.g. social investing? Well, let, let me start. I've got an open mic. Um, it's a great question. And I think underpinning this might be some worries about uh, is there a green asset bubble coming? And is Cushion going to be locked into piling uh, assets into a green asset bubble? Uh, this is one of the reasons why we've been very careful in all three sleeves to make sure that we do spread our assets beyond climate assets, although we think climate assets are extremely important, but we have uh, environmental assets and focus beyond climate. And we certainly have focus on S and G in our listed equities via our sustainable development goal uh, alignments, which go well, well beyond climate assets uh, within our, our fixed income uh, allocation, because we particularly picked Wellington because they run climate impact alongside social impact in this fund. And likewise, uh, we were very attracted by Schroeder's offer to include other assets inside this private market sleeve, including social housing. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment? No hands up there. There seems to be a few questions coming in just on the, the issue of higher fees, private markets, etc. I think we could sort of tackle this just from the from the broader, broader base of how you, Julius, and Cushion and anyone else who moves into private markets um, balances um, that need or the, the objective to get good outcomes for, for members, do good for the environment, to get their pension to do good, but also get those good returns in the context of constraints on saving already? Well, as I said before, we're, we're not going to, we're, we're not going to refuse to offer product to somebody who doesn't believe that private markets offer value. So you can have the cushion uh, default fund, sorry, Emily, without private markets at a lower price. If that's what you want, we think it's a mistake because we'll charge you 10 basis points, investment TER extra, if you want an allocation to private markets. If you want the allocation to private markets, we recommend. But the value you as an employer and your members are going to get for that extra 10 basis points is fantastic. It will flow through in terms of improved risk adjusted returns, and it will flow through in a massively increased proportion of your employees being aware that you as an employer are putting money into their pension scheme. And if we're really good at our job, it will result in big proportions of your employees being proud of the pension you as an employer have chosen for them. And are we any good at this? Well, yes, we are. We can get 85% of our members to engage with us on our app. This is transformational. Private markets, in my view, without any question of a doubt, add value to members and to employers. Thanks, Julius. Just going back to the, the start of the discussion. Um, we've got about 10 minutes. Um, so if there's any more questions, please just pop them in now. Um, but I'm quite interested to know when you were changing your investment strategy, what barriers or issues you faced as an organisation to pull that bespoke strategy together? Sorry, Joe, just coming off mute. Uh, well, uh, I think the fee conundrum was a, was a, a, major, a major challenge. Uh, we had to work very hard. We had to innovate very hard to deliver this whole package 
at uh, 15 basis points of TER. It required a lot of uh, supportive work from our three partners uh, that we have on the panel here. That was extremely important. Um, we had to do a great deal of work with our private uh, market sleeve in terms of getting our trustees and our platform provider Mobius comfortable with all the liquidity and valuation issues, which I may have sounded like I was trivialising. They're real. We had to work through them. They are not obstacles to making progress on private markets, but they are certainly issues. Uh, and then uh, it, there was a lot of work involved uh, designing the bespoke index because it would have been much easier to have pulled an index off the shelf, but we could not find one that combined the right backward looking and forward looking climate characteristics and included the SDG alignment. That was crucial for us. So those, those I guess, were the main challenges and our trustees have put in a, a huge amount of work. Last time I checked with them, I think we'd had 35 meetings with the trustee over the course of this year. This is intensive work. 35 meetings? and were 35 they trustee meetings. Fair enough. And what was the area where they were most needed convincing on? Uh, well, I may, I may be convincing is the wrong, is the wrong word because they were uh, supportive of what we were trying to do um, from outset. But they were trustees and they are fiduciaries. They're ultimately on the hook for this strategy. And therefore, they were very demanding in terms of uh, wanting to understand how we justified the price points, uh, how we were dealing with uh, all the things I've talked about already. Um, and more significantly, uh, you know, how we were ensuring that this focus on climate delivered value uh, and did not erode forward looking risk adjusted returns. You know, the basic fiduciary question. So all, all the questions that a fiduciary would typically ask, but given that we were innovating across 100 percent of the strategy, so there is nothing left of the old strategy. This is all new. Uh, there was a great deal of work involved to get our trustees comfortable with uh, a universally 100% new set of investment mandates. Thank you. Just a question to the panel, having gone through this journey together on creating this new bespoke strategy, um, what advice would you give to an asset owner or trustees or even pension scheme members who, are, who want their um, pension managers to move faster towards decarbonizing their pensions. Perhaps uh, Jennifer, you could start. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so one advice or what we found out is that um, it's on the one per, uh, in the first place, very good to define targets. So what is important to the asset owner or asset manager? Um, then also looking for how can you implement this credibly. So there's a, a big question about data, data uh, quality, and also data coverage, which was an important part of the index development so that we decided on the uh, data points which lead to the desired outcome. And also um, explain it on the one hand to Cushion and also to the trustees to make them feel comfortable. And then in the end, it's about reporting, which is also an important part which avoids the claim of greenwashing because when you are transparent on the criteria, on the way it's constructed and also on the outcomes, I think it's already a good start to feel comfortable on getting on the decarbonization track. Thank you. And Emily? So I think within the private market context, it's really making sure that the asset owner investor is close to their assets. So building very similar to what Jennifer said, but it's both having that intent, contribution and measurement within the investment context, but having private market owners that are close to their assets means that they can really actually provide that contribution or additionality and, and make the changes that are necessary. But only if you've already stated that intent and set those objectives, are you then able to measure it? So having all three of those pieces. Um, diversification then is, is another thing that I think is particularly important. So when looking at a portfolio construction of of these assets, it's that balance of making sure that the right managers are owning these assets and then that a portfolio is constructed in a, in a prudent way. Thank you. And Paul? Oh, I think Emily is absolutely right. Embedding that diversity is vital. And, um, you know, as we take this journey that I've mentioned before um, on, on climate, there are two risks. There's a the transition risk and being impact investors, we're not going to invest and put capital into a company or an issuer who is going to do damage to the environment. That's very, very important. But the secondary thing is that we've got to look at what is happening in climate change. You know, how is this going to affect the actual investments we've got? And we've dedicated a huge amount of uh, time and resources 
at Wellington to a partnership with the Woodwell Institute, which is a sort of um, a preeminent uh, climate change institute in the States. And we have actually mapped the world with their help in 50 kilometer squares as to how it's going to change in heat, drought, uh, air quality, uh, hurricanes, wildfire. And so that when we look at our investments, we can challenge those issuers about how they are going to respond in the next 10 to 15 years and how are they going to be able to um, mitigate those changes. Here. So there's two aspects to that. Um, and, uh, and I think that's very important. But, you know, you ask what would be the advice? I think Cushion are um, admirable in being first movers. They are really at the forefront of this. And I think, you know, everyone needs to look at their investments and look at how they can be as far forward thinking as Cushion have been. And, um, you know, all these things that we discussed on the private side, on what we can do in equities, um, is all about being at the forefront of those developments. So that, that's the advice I give is, is that this is moving capital. It's changing pricing and we need to uh, be ahead of it, as do our stakeholders. Thank you, Paul. We've got three minutes to go. Final question for Julius. And um, we started with a question about members and we're going to end with a question about members. Uh, the question is, how are you going to use this investment strategy to engage members? Yeah, thanks, Joe. A quick response to that one. We use our tech. Uh, it's really effective. It's easy to use. It's slick. Uh, it's impactful and uh, it's so easy to use that 85% of members, uh, when they sign direct up onto Cushion Tech, find they've downloaded and activated the app and are interacting with us within a, a very small number of months. And I won't labour the point, but um, I just mentioned Google Needle Chicks. That's how we engage members. C can I pick up a couple of other questions in the sleeve? Um, I, I, I picked up the person who asked about Schroeder's. It goes with the territory, doesn't it? If you invest in private markets, it's not as easy to move those assets away from a manager. You're right. That's part of the decision making process. Do you want to go into private markets uh, in the first place? Uh, I've been investing in private markets with the DC hat on for many years now. And on balance, uh, it's delivered value. I think it will deliver more value going forwards. Final question uh, I'll pick up is what do we do for members as they approach retirement? Well, we begin to de risk seven years away from the expected retirement date into a drawdown like set of assets, which has an ex ante vol of 10 and a half percent. So it's much less risky than the default fund, but it's still got risk assets inside it. Crucial is that we delay de-risking until seven years before expected retirement. How can we afford to do that? We can afford to do that because we don't have swathes of disengaged members who don't know when they're going to retire and don't know when, whether they're in the right de-risking strategy. Because we've got 85% engaged members, pretty well, they know when they're going to retire, we can afford a shorter de-risking period. That produced a massive increase to member expected outcomes. Thank you, Julius. And that brings us up to uh, two minutes, one minute to go to the um, close today. So I've got one minute to, to wind things up. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have. And it's a shame because we've had so many questions. Uh, and there's a lot of interest uh, in the topics we've covered today. We did cover a lot of ground, starting off with member engagement and drilling down into what um, Cushion is doing in terms of its growth strategy with global equities, with bonds, and also with private markets. So I hope that um, you can take something away from, from this seminar and you've learned that there are lots of um, opportunities and also challenges and, and for the industry and members to move forward uh, with investing for good. But from the interest in today's seminar and from the questions from the audience, I expect this is not the end of the conversation, but just the beginning. On that note, that brings us to a close of today's event. Thank you to our excellent speakers, Julius, Emily, Jennifer, Paul, and Ben, very Elon. And thanks to Cushion and the great team behind the scenes, Louise, for working hard to make the event very smooth. That brings us to the end of today's event. Good afternoon, everyone.